Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Abolition in Ireland, Daniel O'Connell and Frederick Douglass. This is the last in an online series of three presentations developed in complement to the Knights of Columbus Museum's Voices for Freedom display. On behalf of the Knights of Columbus Museum, thank you for joining this session which is being recorded and will be available later for on-demand viewing via the museum's YouTube channel. The first two sessions of the series are available on YouTube now. A few notes before we begin. The Knights of Columbus Museum remains closed while we wait and pray for the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. For information about the museum and its upcoming events and offerings, visit kofcmuseum.org or follow the museum on social media channels at kofcmuseum. The next online presentation will be Thursday, May 7th at 2 p.m. The presenter is iconographer Marek Sarnecki, who will discuss the evolution of the Blessed Virgin Mary's depiction in sacred art. A registration link is available on the museum's website, event listing page, as well as its Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds. For any students assigned to complete the quiz based on today's presentation, you may download it in the handout section. Also, there is a listing from our presenter of suggestions for further reading and study on today's topic as well as the summary listing for the entire lecture series. Attendees may submit questions at any point in the presentation using the questions utility. I'll monitor activity throughout the presentation and can respond privately to anyone experiencing technical issues. I'll read questions pertaining to the talk in a Q&A session at its conclusion. The presentation should last about 30 minutes. I'm delighted again to welcome Professor Christine Keneally, Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, and to thank her for developing and presenting this three-week series. A graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, Dr. Keneally has lectured extensively, authored many books, and taught both in America and Europe. She is renowned internationally for her scholarship on the Irish famine and its consequences. She also spearheaded a tribute to Frederick Douglass at Quinnipiac University two years ago, and obviously has great esteem for his spirit and perseverance, as I'm certain will be evident soon. Suffice it to say, Christine has researched many key figures in the abolitionist movement. We enjoyed her presentations on Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, William Lloyd Garrison, and look forward to learning now about the roles O'Connell and Douglas played to end slavery in Ireland and the UK. Professor Christine Keneally, I now turn the conversation over to you and will return at the end of your presentation for questions. Okay. Okay. Um, I can see me and I can see you, Peter. Can you see? Sorry. We're good to go. I see your presentation. Okay, it's up. So um, I don't see it. <laughs> Sorry. Perhaps it's uh, it's below your presentation screen on your desktop. Okay, I can see it now. Can you still see it? I can. Okay, so we want the technology to be good to us again this week. So, Peter, thank you very much for your lovely introduction and for hosting this series of three lectures. Um, it's really been a pleasure putting them together. And I thank you and the Knights of Columbus for thinking through this crisis in such a positive and a creative, imaginative way. So, thank you. 
Uh, today is the third and final lecture, and it follows on the first lecture was on British abolition with particular focus on Thomas Clark and William Wilberforce. Last week's lecture was on William Lloyd Garrison and the American abolition movement. And then this week's lecture is something very close to my heart. It's on the Irish abolition movement and the particular roles played by Daniel O'Connell and Frederick Douglass. And as Peter said, I am an Irish historian. My great interest is in the history of social justice. And that really led me to study the great famine, the great hunger as we know it in America. And from that, I evolved an interest in Irish abolition and in Daniel O'Connell and Daniel O'Connell led me to Frederick Douglass. And um, Frederick Douglass has sort of been my research interest, my passion for about 10 years. Um, I continue to learn new things about him and continue to be impressed with what a fantastic man and civil rights leader he was. So there's a lot to get in today, so I will start. So um, I hope I'll start. So yes, okay, no more hitches. So just to recap, we looked two weeks ago at the role of Britain and as I explained then, Britain played a dual role in the ending of the slave trade and slavery because Britain was actually a major beneficiary of the slave trade. Um, I've said this before, but between 1700 and 1807, they transported almost 3 million Africans across the Atlantic. But at the same time they were doing that, uh, movement gained ground to actually end the slave trade. And as a result of that, in 1807, legislation ended the slave trade in the British Empire. And from that point onwards, Britain tried to persuade other countries to similarly end their involvement in the slave trade. They hoped that slavery would naturally come to an end as a result of slaves not being replenished. Of course, that did not happen. So 1833, they actually ended slavery throughout the British Empire. And they did it with some provisos. Slave owners received 20 million pounds in compensation and they imposed on the enslaved a system of apprenticeship. So it wasn't total and it wasn't immediate. And it angered some people. Essentially though, it was good. American anti-slavery, 1619, the first American slaves arrived on the shores of colonial America. So last year we were celebrating the 400th anniversary. 1807, the same time as Britain, an act was passed to prohibit the importation of any more enslaved people into America. 1830s witnessed a rise in a new form of abolition, much more radical than what had gone earlier. And at the forefront of this movement was William Lloyd Garrison, a man very much associated with Boston and with the Liberator newspaper. 1863, at the height of a violent civil war, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And then 1865, when the war ended, the 13th Amendment was adopted, abolishing slavery and involuntary servitude. So as you can see from this timeline, it took many decades before slavery was ended. And now I want to look at Ireland and its role in anti-slavery. <clears throat> and if you don't know any Irish history, I want to provide some background. So Ireland was not a major player in the slave trade. A few merchants did benefit individually, but not many. The country as a whole was not involved. Those merchants who benefited were primarily Protestant, because as I hope to explain, Catholics in Ireland were subject to many restrictions. As happened in Britain at the end of the 18th century, an anti-slavery movement gained ground. It was mostly associated with the Quakers and other non-conformist groups. And the Quakers in particular were known for their very progressive views on a lot of issues. In 1829, uh, was in Ireland, this was replaced more Bernian and this society Garrison and they in turn greatly admired the work that Garrison was doing and one of the things that needs to be borne in mind about what was happening in Ireland was that Ireland was a colony 
So all the time that Ireland was fighting for the freedom of the enslaved people elsewhere, it was also fighting for the freedom of Ireland itself. So that gave it a very, very particular role. I'm getting a message I have to ignore. Right. So I just want to take you back very briefly to Ireland's role as a colony. So Ireland very famously was Britain's first colony. And this relationship goes back eight centuries. The Anglo-Normans who evolved into the English, who evolved into the British, first came to Ireland in 1169. And they came as invaders to Wexford, which is south of Dublin, but they gradually extended their control throughout the country. Not without some resistance, it has to be said, but they built these castles. You can possibly see Carrick Fergus Castle, which is north of Belfast, the very north of the island. So very imposing structures clearly said to the native Irish, we have come here as warriors. And from the outset, the invaders looked down on the Irish. Despite Ireland having a centuries old civilization, they regarded the Irish people as barbarous who needed to be civilized. So this relationship has gone on for many centuries and has gone through various changes. And I just want to mark a few of the significant individuals and landmarks in this relationship. You may have heard of Henry VIII, famous for his six wives, but also in Ireland famous for other things. Henry wanted to annul his marriage to his first wife. He was a Catholic, he appealed to the Pope and the Pope said no. So at that point, very famously and very publicly, Henry broke with the Catholic Church in Rome. And he declared himself to be the head of the church in both Britain and in Ireland. And from this point onwards, the Protestant Church in Ireland became known as the Church of Ireland. To replenish his failing coffers because he needed money, he closed the monasteries, these great centers of learning, and he took their money. And you can see the ruins of a monastery. There are many of them scattered throughout Ireland. And also he changed his title from Lord of Ireland to King of Ireland. So again, a new development in the relationship between Britain and Ireland. And from this point onwards, there were various attempts to make the Catholic population of Ireland Protestant. They failed and Ireland remained 85% Catholic despite poverty and all these attempts to proselytize them. So the 17th century, it's sometimes called the Protestant century. And again, there were various attempts to make Ireland Protestant. One of the attempts was the plantation of Ulster, which started around 1609. Catholics were forcibly removed from the land, especially the good quality land in the northeast of the country and their property and land was given to settlers from Britain. The majority of those settlers actually came from Scotland and were Presbyterian. And if you think, why is the Northeast corner of Ireland today predominantly Protestant? Because of this plantation. So it really changed the course of Irish history. The end of the century, a body of legislation was passed that was really anti-Catholic. Other non-conformist groups were targeted, but so-called papists, as Catholics were known, were mostly targeted. And as a result of this, Catholics were denied basic civil rights. They couldn't vote, they couldn't sit in Parliament, they couldn't own a horse, they couldn't own a gun, they couldn't build schools, they couldn't build churches. And because they couldn't build churches, a habit grew up that people would meet at a rock. And there, their priest would say mass in the open air. So today, we still know the sites of some mass rocks in Ireland. So Irish native Catholics were systematically deprived of their civil rights and also of the good quality land. And increasingly, they turned to potatoes to survive. And sometimes when I talk about the famine, people say, well, why did they eat so many potatoes? Wasn't that stupid? They had no choice to eat potatoes. And potatoes, in fact, were a super crop. And Irish people before the Great Hunger were the tallest, healthiest people in Europe, despite their poverty in other ways. And if I can just give you one statistic, by 1714, Catholics, 85% of the population, only owned 
5% of the land in Ireland. And so given that shocking statistic, it makes sense to eat potatoes, something that was so nutritious and life-giving. So, as I said, there were many attempts to get rid of the English, of the British, they were all unsuccessful. But at the end of the 18th century, a new society was formed, the United Irishmen. And they were very inspired by what had happened in America, in France, and in Haiti, where they'd had revolutions that spread the ideas of liberty and equality. And Irish people felt, now is our time. And this movement was spearheaded by a progressive Protestant, Theobald Wolfe Tone. And for a number of years, he had been agitating for Catholics in Ireland to have the same rights as Protestants. He knew that Ireland was too small to take on the might of Britain and be successful, and so he appealed to France for help. And this is the motto of the United Irishman. What is that in your hand? It is a branch. Of what? Of the tree of liberty. Where did it grow? In America. Where does it bloom? In France. Where did the seeds fall? In Ireland. And they wanted an independent Irish Republic. And in the words of Theobald Wolf, Wolf Tone, to substitute the common name of Irishman in place of the denominations of Protestant, Catholic and dissenter. And in some ways, the United Irishmen were very much ahead of their time. They were progressive, they were Republican, they were Democrats, they believed that every man should have the right to vote. And unusually, they opposed slavery. And in 1798, the United Irishmen led a rising in Ireland, and of course, it was unsuccessful and brutally put down by the British government. But in the meantime, they invited an uh, former slave to visit Ireland, Odela Equiano. And if you lo looked at the lecture two weeks ago, you'll be familiar with the incredible Equiano. He was born in Africa. When he was about 11, he and his sister were captured and enslaved. He worked as a sailor. He eventually purchased his freedom and decided he wanted to live in England. And he very much energized the abolition movement. As we saw, he worked with William Wilberforce. He worked with Thomas Clarkson. And his actions were very important in finally bringing the slave trade to an end. He wrote a narrative of his life, which was very successful, and paved the way for subsequent enslaved people to write narratives. And from our perspective, very importantly, he lectured in Ireland in 1791. And he came to Ireland as a guest of the United Irishmen. He stayed for eight months and he wrote of his experience. In May 1791, I sailed from Liverpool to Dublin, where I was very kindly received and from thence to Cork, and then traveled over many counties in Ireland. I was everywhere exceedingly well treated by persons of all ranks. I found the people extremely hospitable, particularly in Belfast. And in some ways, Equiano paved the way for later black abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, to visit Ireland. Unlike Equiano, they all commented on how well they were treated in Ireland. As I said, his hosts were the United Irishmen, a number of whom took part in the 1798 rebellion, and a number of whom lost their lives, as did Wolf Tone, or were exiled for their part in the rising. So the actions of Equiano, Wilberforce, Clark, and as I said, led to the ending of the slave trade in 1807. After that, the movement went quiet for a number of years. But it revived in the 1820s when it was patently clear that slavery was not going to come to a natural ending. And the revival of the movement in the 20s was far more radical than it had been earlier. At this stage, William Wilberforce, who you can see in the middle, was suffering from ill health. And in 1823, he decided to retire from the British Parliament. And this led a tremendous gap in the abolition movement. But fortunately, his retirement coincided with the rise of a new star in abolition. And that star was the man you'll see at the end, Irishman Daniel O'Connell. And I just briefly want to look at Daniel O'Connell and his role in anti-slavery. 
So if you don't know anything about O'Connell, he was born in County Kerry in the far west of Ireland, 1775. He was a Catholic and as a Catholic, he was disadvantaged in a number of ways. He had to attend university in France. No university in Ireland would take Catholics, but then he attended law schools in London and Dublin. If he'd been born a few years earlier, that would not have been possible. And he used his very immense skills as a lawyer and as an orator to fight for equal rights for Catholics in Ireland. And from his perspective, Irish people were enslaved in a different way from African slaves, but enslaved. And this is a quote from 1812. My days, the blossom of my youth and the flower of my manhood have been darkened by the dreariness of servitude. In this, my native land, in the land of my sires, I am degraded without fault as an alien and an outcast. So in the mid twenties, O'Connor was introduced to the abolition movement and he very quickly emerged as a champion of not just Catholic rights, but of human rights. Wherever he saw injustice, he fought against it. He fought for the rights of Maoris in New Zealand, of Aborigines in Australia. So he truly was international in his outlook. And whenever he spoke in public, he always referred to abolition and urged people to support the abolition movement. He was radical. He believed that the ending of enslavement should be immediate and it should be absolute. He also believed, and this was controversial at the time, that as he called, said, black people were the equals of white people. They just needed to be free. And he said black people having become free would in time become full members of society, would fill offices of importance and work out their own independence. So at the same time he was fighting to end enslavement, he was also fighting for the rights of Catholics. And this movement is known as Catholic emancipation. He wanted Catholics to have the right to sit in the British parliament. At this point, Ireland was governed by the Parliament in London, but Catholics could not sit in it. So in the 1820s, he masterminded a mass movement to put pressure on the British government. And the British government, fearing there would be a rising in Ireland and that it might be successful, in 1829 granted Catholic emancipation. So from this point onwards, Catholics throughout the United Kingdom could sit in the Parliament in London. And as a result of this great achievement, O'Connor was given the name the Liberator. And as a member of the British Parliament himself, he then agitated to end enslavement. And you might look at the bell and think, why is there a picture of the Liberty Bell in a slide to do with O'Connell? So the saying is that when people in Philadelphia heard about Catholic emancipation, they asked that the Liberty Bell be rung in salute to the great Daniel O'Connell. And according to one myth, and I do think this is a myth, it was rung so hard that it cracked at that point. But what is important is that O'Connell at this stage was a transatlantic figure. And just to prove it, in December 1832, a group of free people of color in New York sent a thank you to O'Connell. And it was quite a long tribute, I just want to read a bit of it, that we recognize in the Honorable O'Connell of Ireland, the champion of religious freedom, the uncompromising advocate of universal emancipation, the friend of the oppressed Africans and their descendants, and of the unadulterated rights of man. And they go on to wish him best and say how he will be recognized in heaven when he dies. So it's a very moving tribute. So, about the 1830s, even after slavery had ended in the British Empire, O'Connell continued to agitate, to agitate for enslavement to end wherever it existed. In 1838, he came to the attention of people throughout the world because at that point, he refused to shake the hands of the American ambassador to London, Andrew Stevenson. Andrew Stevenson was greatly insulted and challenged O'Connell to a duel, to a fight. O'Connell refused. But this controversy was played out in newspapers in Ireland, in Britain, and in America for months. And in America, O'Connell very much polarized opinion. Again, this is a quote from the Richmond Enquirer. 
nothing can exceed the gross prejudice which this man has conceived against the southern states. We pronounce Daniel O'Connell's attack on the Virginia character to be wanton and an infamous libel. And this incident is important for many reasons, but one reason is that Frederick Douglass later said that this was the first time he heard of the name of the Irishman O'Connell. He said he heard it on the lips of his master, who said, how dare this Irishman intervene in our affairs? And Frederick Douglass said he knew at that point that if his master hated this man, that he should love him. And from that point onwards, one of his greatest wishes, apart from to be free, was to meet Daniel O'Connell. So last week, the week before, we looked at the first anti-slavery convention in 1840, which brought abolitionists from throughout the world to London. As we said, Thomas Clarkson, who is pictured there standing up, was the chairperson, but Daniel O'Connell, who was the first person to speak, was the star of the convention. Charles Lennox Raymond, a free black man who traveled to London with William Lloyd Garrison, said of O'Connell, no nation or people possesses a superior to Daniel O'Connell. And around this time, a new star was emerging in abolition in America. August 1841, a three-day anti-slavery convention was held on Nantucket Island. A 23-year-old fugitive slave attended a man who had never received a formal day's education in his life, but who was totally self-taught. At one point, he was asked to speak, and with knees shaking, he got up and made a speech that electrified the audience. And one of the audience happened to be William Lloyd Garrison, who recognized the potential of this young man and offered him a job as an agent of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which the young Frederick Douglass accepted. In 1845, Douglas, following in the footsteps of Equiano and others, published his life story, partly to answer doubts that had been cast on his own story. It was published in May 1845, and William Lloyd Garrison wrote the preface. And in the preface, Garrison plays tribute to Daniel O'Connell, the distinguished advocate of universal emancipation, the mightiest champion of prostrate but not conquered. Ireland. And Frederick's narrative became a bestseller, but it also put him in danger of being recaptured and returned to enslavement. And so, reluctantly, he was persuaded to go to the United Kingdom, where he would be safe. And Garrison was also hopeful that Douglas could help build a transatlantic abolition movement. So, Frederick, arrived in Liverpool at the end of 1840, August 1845. He stayed in the city for two days and then he sailed to Dublin. And he went to Dublin because a Quaker printer who was an abolitionist, Richard Davis Webb, had offered to reprint the narrative so that Frederick could sell it and have some funds during his exile. So Frederick arrived in Dublin 31st of August 1845. He straight away wrote to Garrison and said that he was now safe in Old Ireland. And Frederick came to Dublin intending to stay in the city for, for four days. He was made so welcome that he stayed for four months. And he later described his time in Ireland as being transformative because not only did he feel safe in Old Ireland, for the first time in his life, he felt equal. And only two weeks after being in Ireland, he wrote to Garrison. One of the most pleasing features of this visit thus far has been a total absence of all manifestations of prejudice against me on account of my colour. The change of circumstances in this is particularly striking. I find myself not treated as a colour, but as a man, not as a thing, but as a child of the common father of us all. So there were many highlights of Frederick's time in Dublin. He met his great hero, Father Matthew, a Catholic priest who was called the Apostle of Intemperance, who persuaded people not to drink alcohol. And Frederick himself was a great supporter of temperance. He never drank. Frederick was invited to dine with the Lord Mayor of Dublin in the Mansion House. And of course, the greatest highlight was on the 29th of September, 
he heard O'Connell speak. And O'Connell was speaking about the need for Irish independence, but he also spoke about abolition. And after hearing him speak, Frederick wrote a letter to Garrison saying, I have heard many speakers within the last four years, speakers of the first order, but I confess, I have never heard one by whom I was more completely captivated than by Mr. O'Connell. It seems to me that the voice of O'Connell is enough to calm the most violent passion. There is a sweet pervasiveness in it beyond any voice I ever heard. His power over an audience is perfect. And the building you see at the bottom is Conciliation Hall, which is where Frederick heard O'Connell speak. It could hold 3,000 people. And that night it was full, and so Frederick stood at the back. But when O'Connell stopped speaking, people started to leave, and so Frederick moved to the front, where he was introduced to Daniel O'Connell's son, John. And John, in turn, introduced him to his father. And Daniel O'Connell turned to the people leaving and said, don't leave, stay. I want you to hear our young visitor from America. And Frederick Douglass was then asked to speak. And of course, he got up and made an incredible impromptu speech, which ended. The poor trampled slave of Carolina had heard the name of the liberator with joy and hope. And he himself had heard the wish that some black O'Connell would yet rise among his countrymen and cry, agitate, agitate, agitate. And again, this speech, which is fantastic, is important for a number of reasons. The phrase black O'Connell, and throughout the rest of his life, Frederick referred to himself as the Black O'Connell. And he also adopted the phrase agitate, 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 which was a phrase he borrowed from O'Connell, but which he made particularly his own. So Frederick left Dublin um, after a month there, and he lectured in Wexford, Waterford, York, Cork, Limerick and Belfast. He really lectured all over Ireland. And in Cork, he, a party was held in his honour and 250 people there. And he said, I saw no one that seemed to be shocked or disturbed at my dark presence. No one seemed to feel himself contaminated by contact with me. So again, a very liberating experience for the young Frederick Douglass. Frederick left Ireland January 1846. And again, he wrote to Garrison, he said, I can truly say, I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. He then traveled to Scotland where he started to feel homesick and to cheer himself up, he bought a fiddle, a violin, and he taught himself to play. And whenever he was homesick, he would play the fiddle and think of home. He lectured in Scotland and England for a further 16 months. In that during that time, a number of women abolitionists bought his freedom. And so in April 1847, Frederick was able to return home to his wife and four young children as a free man. And what's significant is at that point, he broke softly with Garrison. He moved his family up to Rochester and against the advice of Garrison, he started his own newspaper, The North Star. So later life. It's very clear that Frederick's time in exile really transformed him from being an abolitionist into a champion of human rights. And throughout the remainder of his life, he fought not just for an ending to slavery, but for the equality. And again, like O'Connell, he fought for equality wherever he saw oppression. And his support extended to including support for women's rights. You probably know that in 1848, he was one of the few men who signed the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention. But one of the things that disappointed Frederick was he had seen abolition in Ireland and he described Irish abolitionists as being the most ardent in the world. Yet when he returned to America, he saw that Irish Americans often did not support abolition and a number of them were pro-slavery. And this was something that bothered him and bothered O'Connell. And O'Connell wrote to Irish Americans saying, how can the generous, the charitable, the humane and the noble emotions of the Irish heart have become extinct amongst you? It was not in Ireland that you learned this cruelty. And of course, this prejudice led to the tragic uh, 
New York City riots in July 1863, when Irish immigrants attacked free black people. And it was a tragic and shameful episode in our history. So during the Civil War, Frederick, as we know, came to advise President Lincoln. He repeatedly argued for African-American men to serve in the Union Army. Following the emancipation, this was possible, and two of Frederick's sons actually fought and survived. They both won medals. So forgiveness, and I think sometimes we can draw inspiration from Frederick's life, from what he suffered, and his spirit of love and of forgiveness. In 1877, he met his former master, Thomas Old, who was dying. During the meeting, the men held hands and Frederick later wrote that they both cried throughout the meeting. Old said to Frederick, I always knew you were too smart to be a slave. And had I been in your place, I should have done as you did. And Douglas responded, I did not run away from you. I ran away from slavery. 1889, Frederick agreed to be the American Consul General to Haiti. And if you don't know anything about the history of Haiti, I would encourage you to read something. Um, Haiti was the first black republic in the world. It had sought its freedom in the 1790s. And uh, it, had, it went from being the richest island in the world to being one of the poorest islands in the world because France, who had colonized it, imposed cruel reparations on it. And Frederick Douglass was always fascinated by the history of Haiti and believed that other countries should be similarly impressed with what it had achieved. So in 1889, he went to Haiti as its consul general. He resigned two years later, but his experiences made a very deep impression on him. In 1893, there was the World's Fair in Chicago, and Frederick very deliberately chose that he would appear with the Haiti grouping. And he made a fantastic speech on Haiti. And during his speech, he again referenced Ireland and O'Connell. And this is 1893. It was once said by the great Daniel O'Connell that the history of Ireland might be traced like a wounded man through a crowd by the blood. The same may be said of the history of Haiti as a free state. Her liberty was born in blood, cradled in misfortune, and has lived more or less in a storm of revolutionary turbulence. And this is almost 40 years after he met the great Daniel O'Connell, yet the man's words continue to have an impression on him. In February 1895, Frederick Douglass died. He was 77 years old. That day he had attended a meeting in Washington for women's suffrage and had been given a standing ovation. He came home to have dinner with his wife, Helen, and he was going to a different meeting in the evening. He was waiting in the hallway for his carriage to arrive and he suffered a massive heart attack from which he never recovered. So just to conclude, as I hope I've shown you, Frederick Douglass never forgot Ireland. And I'm really happy to say that Ireland has not forgotten the great Frederick Douglass. You can see some plaques to him, um, which are in the south of Ireland in Waterford in Cork. And the mural, which you see with Frederick at the center, uh, you might be able to spot Daniel O'Connell. Maybe you can spot President Obama, many other people, but this beautiful wall painting is in Belfast. And I'm happy to say that Quinnipiac as Peter said, has not forgotten Frederick. We are lucky to have this beautiful statue on one of our campuses. Sadly, at the moment, it is closed to the public. But this statue was made to honor President Obama's visit to Ireland in 2011. And it depicts Frederick as a 27 year old, the age he was when he came to Ireland. And the symbolism is he is wearing Daniel O'Connell's cloak. He is wearing President Lincoln's clothes, um, sorry, waistcoat or vest. And his right hand, which is outstretched, is an exact replica of President Obama's hand. And it's just a beautiful statue. It's over eight foot. And finally, some extra reading. And I think though we'll end maybe by looking at the young Frederick 
and being reminded of what a powerful orator he was. And we are going to have some music. And if I can just maybe explain, um, earlier on I talked about the various disabilities which were imposed on Catholics in their own country. And as I said, one of them was that they could not build churches. And so as a result of that, people would go to mass outdoors and usually the priest would say uh, the mass in front of a large rock. Uh, this is a traditional Irish song. It's just music, it's played on the fiddle. And it's, will you, have you been to the rock or will you meet me at the rock? And it was a way of saying, are you a Catholic? And when Frederick was in Ireland, he remarked on how much he loved Irish music because it reminded him of the music of the plantations. And I like to think that this is one piece of music that Frederick might have listened to, and it gave him, I hope, happy memories of home. So Peter, if you want to play the music, Thank you, Christine. If you don't mind, I think I'd like to uh, field the questions and perhaps we can end on the uh, on the music. Okay, deferred are you gratification ready to, are you ready is good. To take... Excellent, I'm grateful. So our first question uh, is, um... oops, excuse me. Did, uh, did O'Connell support Douglas or Garrison in their split? Oh, at this stage, um, Frederick, at this stage, sorry, Daniel O'Connell was dead. So when he met Frederick, he was quite old. He was in his 70s and he was starting to suffer bad health. And so O'Connell died in May 1847. And tragically, at the height of the Great Hunger, and O'Connell, his dying wish was to see the Pope. And his final speech he made in the British Parliament was the 8th of February, 1847. And in it, he made an impassioned plea, begging the British government to intervene in Ireland so that more people would not starve. And he said, unless you do, 25% of my people will be lost. As we know, that happened. And sadly, O'Connell never made it to Rome. He died in Genoa on the way to Rome. So he was dead, long dead at this stage. Is and there a book again, or a, it's, a blog? Continue, go ahead. Oh, uh, um, just so Garrison was a great admirer of O'Connell, as I said last week, and his Liberator newspaper often carried the speeches of um, O'Connell and retrospectives, but O'Connell didn't have the same respect for Garrison. They met at least once um, during the anti-slavery convention in 1840, but O'Connell didn't like Garrison's um, very vehement attacks on the churches. He felt that was too extreme. So as individuals, they didn't get on, whereas we could see that O'Connell um, admired Frederick and that was mutual. Thank you. Our next question, is there a, a book or a volume concerning Douglas's speeches in Ireland? I thank you for asking that question. I spent 10 years transcribing every single speech that Frederick Douglass made while he was in Ireland. He made over 50 speeches. Um, I hadn't realized at the start, none of them were written down. So I had to go to various newspapers in order to get to them. And sometimes he would speak for over two hours and every speech is different and every speech is brilliant just totally inspiring so if you want to read his speeches i actually call my book i'm frederick douglas in ireland in his own words because i think nobody can speak better for frederick than frederick can speak for himself excellent thank you is there uh is there a book as well and it, perhaps it's in your uh your suggested reading that describes um, the irish and african people uh in in the us um i in some of the earlier so last week the us story is told there this week it's more the irish story so i have written um about the irish story and i do have them in this week's recommended reading uh, i have a new book that is coming out actually if I can publicize it later in the year because when I was looking at Frederick what I realized is he was the most famous black abolitionist to come to Ireland but he wasn't the only one so I spoke briefly about Equiano uh, but my new book is about 
10 black abolitionists who visited Ireland between 1790 and 1860. And one of them is a woman, but there are others. But what's remarkable is that they all said how welcoming Irish people were and how for the first time they had that sense of being equal. So Ireland was always their favorite place to be. Did Frederick Douglass have an opinion of Catholicism? He was a Methodist um, and he often spoke, and sometimes this got him in trouble when he was lecturing because he was very vehement in criticizing the roles of churches who either were complicit with slavery and some like the Free Presbyterian Church definitely were, or others who didn't speak out against it enough. He tended to be more complimentary about Quakers because most Quakers, as you know, were abolitionists. And he also said that the Catholic Church was in America, saw black people as equals. So in that sense, he was pretty complimentary to the Catholic Church. But in general, he and certainly Garrison believed that the churches, because they were so influential, could and should do more to speak out against slavery. And did Douglas have any interactions with, uh, with Canada? He did. Um, so Canada, as you might know, um, if you, if fugitive, as they were called fugitive slaves, got to Canada, they were safe because Canada, um, like England, refused to accept slavery on its soil. And so after 1850, a new Fugitive Slave Act was passed and a lot of slaves, former slaves, went up to Canada. Um, when Frederick escaped himself in 1838, he had the choice of going to Canada. And he very deliberately said, I want to stay in this country so that I can fight to help other people. So even though he was at some risk, um, he chose that. He felt that he could do more good in America. 1859 though, his friend John Brown led a rising, we spoke about it briefly, and at that point, because they were such good friends, even though Frederick had not been involved, he knew he was in danger of being captured, and so he briefly went to Canada, and from Canada he then sailed over to Britain where he lectured, but he came back to America when he heard that his youngest beloved daughter, Annie, who was age 10, had died. Do we have any uh, written or recorded words of O'Connell and his impressions about Frederick Douglass? No, we don't. Um, and even the speeches of um, O'Connell, which are fantastic on abolition, are scattered. And um, so, no, we don't. And again, I think just the timing, something I didn't really say, but when Frederick came to Ireland, August 1845, he arrived the same time as the blight came and, as we know, partially destroyed the potato crop in 1845, totally destroyed the potato crop in 1846. So at this point, Ireland was on the cusp of a devastating famine. And again, you know, that was something that preoccupied so many people. And again, as I said, um, O'Connell at this stage was older and in declining health. So he wasn't the force he had been a few years earlier. I'm sure if he'd been younger or if the famine had not occurred, there would have been more contact. This quest for universal freedom and civil rights is not yet entirely won. Do you see others carrying on in their footsteps today? Um, today, I think his um, historian, I can deal in the past, so I always think there's sort of a continuum of people. So there's O'Connell, who refused to use violence um, to win political rights. And I think that really influenced Frederick Douglass, because you see Frederick Douglass's philosophy really evolve after he leaves Ireland, and he didn't you know, get involved with John Brown. But then the next generation of Irish nationalists is a young man, um, Michael Davitt, who was born during the famine, his family were evicted. He ended up in England, he worked in a factory. As an 11 year old boy, he lost an arm on the factory machine, but because of that, he got an education. And initially he supported physical force violence to win Irish independence. He was put in prison and he thought about it. And then he came to reject that sort of violence and argued. Um, he actually introduced a system of boycotting and civil disobedience. He in turn influenced Mahatma Gandhi and Gandhi and Frederick Douglass both influenced Martin Luther King 
and they influenced Nelson Mandela in a slightly different way. So I think there are continuums and there are great people. Um, that's a really tough one to think of somebody at the moment. And if I thought of somebody, I'd be afraid of offending. Um, it's a tough one, but I think there is a continuum and I hope somebody emerges. Christine, yeah. can you expand Great. on the relationship between uh, Douglas and John Brown? And did uh, Douglas know about uh, Harper's Ferry? He probably did know about it because shortly before it took place, John Brown came and stayed at um, the Douglas home in Rochester. And I'm sure they had many, many discussions uh, about the right of using physical force, um, you know, what would be the outcome. And because of that relationship, because they were friends and because Brown had been in Douglas's house, that's why he feared arrest. He knew that they would make him another scapegoat. And that's why in 1859, he left Ireland very rapidly. Sorry, Ireland. He left his home in Rochester very, very rapidly. Um, and he lamented John Brown. He saw him as a hero. It's not his path. But he did, and when he was in Britain, he spoke about John Brown at great length and how much he admired him. And in fact, in Connecticut, um, Frederick Douglass came to Connecticut on a number of occasions, and on some occasions he did speak about John Brown here. Well, that's it for our questions, Christine. I'm very grateful. Do you want to, uh, again, uh, before I uh, execute this video, uh, set it up? Uh, were you at The Rock, it's called? So again, it goes back to the days when Irish people couldn't practice their own religion openly. And um, their suffering, I think, you know, periods of famine, periods of uh, being subject to prejudice, I think that gave them an empathy when it came to supporting abolition. Wonderful. Well, as we close, I again extend thanks to Professor Christine Keneally. For further questions about this session or in general, email museum at kofc dot org. We'll conclude with Were You at the Rock? And until next week, good health and God bless.